We are with Hao today, who is going to talk about a very complicated issue and also a very delightful issue, and that's of motherhood. If your mother doesn't accept you, approve of you, it, it, it makes you doubt who you are, your truth, and all that. And it also, even when it comes to friendship and all that, there's still a part of you that is still longing to be accepted. But when you think about that mother wound and how you were living with this mother wound and these unmet needs, thinking they were about you, and then because of trauma from your own journey, your own struggles, now your children also have a mother wound that has nothing to do with them. We want our kids to be the best that they can be, and they are separate from us, even though we'd like them to may maybe be, like you said, something that resembles what we thought might be the case for them. That's right. It's not about us. Our goal is to nurture and love our children for who they are. This podcast represents the opinions of our hosts and guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice and is for informational purposes only. This podcast also does not establish a standard of care, doctor-patient, or client relationship. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website. And because each person is so unique, all listeners are encouraged to connect with counseling and medical professionals for assistance with their personal journey. All people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect the privacy of those involved. Welcome to We're Not Fine. I'm Dr. Talia Jackson. And I'm Doug Jensen. We thank you for listening every week to our deep and thought-provoking conversations about relationships. Welcome to yet another episode of We're, We're Not, Not Fine. Fine. And this is such an interesting episode because we're talking to a person who obviously has a mother situation, but also is a mother themselves. And it's complicated. And, you know, I think this is not a feel good. And as therapists, we oftentimes are not dealing with just feel good people. They don't right. come to our office with that. And this is not a feel good episode. This is a complicated mother situation. But there are um, some yet, pretty beautiful moments. I'd of, say beautiful and insightful and yes. human. And the reality is, I think we all kind of, you know, when I think about social media, by the way, I think about how many mothers at, during Mother's Day right now are going to be very inclined towards seeing what other mothers do and mm. their children do this for them, or they've made 10 dozen cookies. And, That's you know, right. this is not a competition. Mm -hmm. This is about being the best person that you can be as a parent, as a mother in this case. We'll talk about Father's Day when it's Father's Day as a father. But I it's that. very much a we're not fine Mother's Day episode. And our guest is Hao Matsume. Um, and yes, her story is incredible and powerful. But it's going to be so much. Go ahead. I was just going to say that before we get into this beautiful, deep, and inspiring episode, we also just wanted to honor that today is Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Do I know a very funny thing about Cinco de Mayo? Margaritas, guacamole. My dearest friend, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. So, Nicole doesn't like her birthday, which is... Right after the holiday season in the winter mm. time, it's in early January. She doesn't like it. So she told me yesterday she's changing her birthday to Cinco de Mayo because she likes margarita. <laughs> and I must tell you something. I am loving that. So I'm we in. are recording it on Cinco de Mayo yeah. and I texted her happy birthday. And she is like talking about how many margaritas she's having telepathically with me. And yes, we are sharing that day with you. But it's hilarious. It makes I love me it. think. Like, what if we could all choose? I would actually still pick my birthday in September. I love birthdays in September. I don't know. I kind Great of think weather. that maybe I'm going to change mine to Cinco de Mayo are as you, well. You and it's Nicole celebratory. are birthday. I'm going to remember your <laughs> every year. I mean, I just love the idea. Sometimes we need a do-over. Sometimes our birthdays are competing with other big holidays. It makes me so hungry for Mexican food at the moment. Though. I was thirsty for a margarita, but I'm going to have um, our AV John's hibiscus tea. Oh, it's instead. good today. It's very strong, but I do love the idea. So happy birthday, Nicole. This is um, a very special day for you. It's <laughs> so you, great. Since you chose it. I got a little uh, GIF, GIF, whatever it's called from her about, you know, enjoying on the beach chair. So I hope there's a party. I'm sorry. I cannot be there. But so essentially, happy Cinco de Mayo yeah. and meaningful Mother's Day yeah. 
and enjoy this really deep, complex, heartwarming episode of real motherhood. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the topics that we cover in this from abuse to attachment to self-esteem to worthiness to deservingness to how it impacts generational trauma and how yes. we parent our own kids. Mm. I have my own special moments of that that my kids could certainly discuss. Oh, as we well. all do. We and all I, do. Um, I love this episode. It, it really brings a humanness to something that I think gets very fluffy in terms of the Hallmark cards and the the celebration itself. It's not always an easy topic. So please bear with us as we discuss this topic with our amazing guest today. We created a Patreon. You're already getting our podcast. This is the way that you can get more. We did this to increase awareness of mental health, talk about relationships, give people the opportunity to call and write in to two professionals who have done this work for a very long time together. Your support has been so critically important to us continuing and feeling motivated to continue. That's right. You guys right. are helping us expand and grow. We're going to have so much fun with this, you guys. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of We're Not Fine. We are with Kao today, who is going to talk about a very complicated issue and also a very delightful issue, and that's of motherhood. In preparation for Mother's Day here in the U.S., which you are not here, is it a celebration in Germany as well? It's, uh, uh, <laughs> not so much. Maybe That's whoever. So okay. But home with the celebration. Sweet. So we're here to talk about not only your experience as a mother, but as someone who has had a mother relationship that has some challenges and complications, I understand from your bio and from talking with you. Um, and so we're here to talk about all things motherhood today on both sides. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And normally when I start, I love to start with my native greetings. And in Botswana, when we greet each other, we say, Dumela. And what it means, like direct translation, Jumelang is agree. You know, Lokai is where are you? Locate yourself. You know, so I would like to start with that as we are here and all the listeners to say Jumelang, as in like, what are you agreeing to when you talk about motherhood? And even when you look at yourself, when you initiated to motherhood, what is it that you agree to? And where are you even right now? So that's what I would love to start with. Is it Dumelang? Dumelang, you said it perfectly, yeah. So, how we're so happy that you're here. And y you are a mother of three. Absolutely. You are originally from Botswana in Southern Africa, but you're mm -hmm. now living in Germany, which is, there's <coughs> so many interesting cultural pieces of all of this. You come from a long ancestral line of healers in what you call African <coughs> ancient quantum medicine. And yes. you're gonna tell us what, and you call yourself a human MRI and a psychic surgeon. And I'm so excited to ask you about that. And you've also, for the last seven years, you've been helping people break free of toxic generational relationships and patterns that are not working, which is why we thought that today's Mother's Day episode isn't just a celebration of mothers, as of course, you know, it's a very complicated day. And to have a mother and to be a mother and all of these pain points um, and grief and joy, it's very complicated. Yeah, and is. so we first can we start will you tell us what a human mri what a psychic surgeon tell us about your gift i read that i was very curious about yes. that <laughs> um this gift is uh it's i inherited it from my ancestral lineage you know at first when i started i just wanted to i knew what i knew but then when i started being exposed to a lot of things i was like i just want to connect with angels just like everybody else wow. especially with the religious background and with that i was like i'm not even sure what my gifts are and at some point i was just told go back to your roots go mm. back to your roots and when i got there that's when i i embodied this gift and i just started um like i would say more understood it because the first time when i had that clarification of what I do, although I didn't know what I was doing, 
was when I was sitting next to my mom and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I'm sick. I wow. am sick. And he said, what's going on? I just spoke about the pain, the, the pain that is there on the, like on the, on the left side. And I just described it and I, I have to go to the hospital. And she said, that's my pain. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Oh. And then years later, while working with people, I just realized that with this gift, I scanned through the body. But at first, I before I actually understood it, I would just talk to someone and say, oh, this is what is going on. You've got a pain here and all that. And because I didn't fully embody my gifts, I was just picking those pain up. And then from there, with that person, when I asked the following day, how is your pain? It's kind of what pain are you talking about? It's gone just like that. You yeah. know, so that's what I do. I kind of like scan through the body. When I meet people, I just get to know what is going through the body. I would say the body talks to me because it's what calls me to say, this is what needs the most attention here. And some people call me a trauma uplifter. It's kind of like I just do that. And when I go back to understand how my my ancestor used to do this, I bet you might have heard about some people who just um like they, they consume fire. That's kind of like how they did it. Like they, the way we do it, even though I'm being present and witnessing that, it's just like taking that pain and transmuting it through me. But before I awoke and healed myself, I was kind of like taking it and keeping it. Mm -hmm. And then I get to go through the suffering. But when I said yes to all of me, that's when I just kind of like know the magic of just not taking it. I just get to identify what is going on. Just like you get into a scan and say, oh, there is a pain here. There is a block here. There is something that is going on. So emotional, physical, mental. And even when you're talking about the sexual abuse, like, I talk a lot about sexual energy and somehow it's what also calls me. Like if there has been abuse, there is a certain way that I just know in the body, this year is an abuse that happened, whether you are aware of it or not. And if we agree to work together, then I just uh, uplift it and you get to connect with yourself in a deeper way. So basically wow. that's it. Identify and then remove whatever that is there. What's so fascinating about that is I'm thinking about like our work as well and like the intuitive pieces of that. And I'm thinking about people who are incredible empaths too, where there is this intuition of this isn't my pain, this is their pain. And if we're not doing our own work in all of our relationships to make sure that we're more of like, we are understanding, we are seeing, we will help you heal. But I think what you're seeing is you have, because of your own work, you figured out how to be more of an a conduit Absolutely. and a healer. And you're not just taking other people's things and it's making you sick. Yeah. Here's my, you know, you will find, of course, that we're not going to follow this uh, sketch that we have about this conversation I very easily. Her. She yeah, knows I'm because... sorry. I'm just so stuck already on a million <laughs> other questions that I apologize. Um, I'm mesmerized. I want to ask you specifically. So first of all, what a very powerful story, what a very powerful skill um, and gift. I want to go back to your comment about helping people move out of it, like mm -hmm. not only identifying the pain, but helping them move through it or past it. How does that happen? When someone says, uh, when someone agrees to release it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When I go through, let me say, I'm having a, I can be having a conversation and yep. it's quite interesting. One thing that I just want to bring into awareness is not only us here, it's even the listeners because energy is always present for the people who are even going to watch in the future. And yep. We're talking about healing the mother wound, right? And as we are here, um, where the energy is, it's in the wounded masculine and it's also ancestral. Like that's what I'm sitting with right here and right now, you know, and the, this is like what is going to come through for a lot of people. And I always talk about this to say, now I actually kind of like forget about your question. <laughs> it's really okay. <laughs> you're going wherever. But wait, what did you just say? How that right now, what you're sitting with is wounded, masculine, wounded masculine energy. Ancestral. 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 Yep. So we um wow. we have had a psychic on our episodes a couple times and she doesn't necessarily deal with that pain she deals with but she talks a lot about the ancestral piece yes. of the work that we have to do in order to move in an emotional way in a healthier way um i'm very curious 
I get so distracted by questions. Um, I'm curious about how you differentiate between something that needs medical help, like when you were with your mother and you felt her pain, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate between something that needs that or something that needs to be resolved in the way that you can heal? What I can, what I can say with that, I can say we work with the doctors. You know, I can't say, okay, fine, just come and, and, and focus on me. I would love to know. Either you know what is going on or you don't. Like, I'll give you an example. I was I got you. With, other, with this other young lady who she had, um, oh, my God, endometriosis. Yep. And uh, she was scheduled for a, for a surgery, you know. And uh, she was, like, the surgery was scheduled some months from the time when, we, when, when her mother actually came to me and said, my daughter is going through this, will you help her? And she came through and we started working together. And the surgery was still there and we started doing the work. And after four weeks, like we met once per week, after four weeks, she went back to her doctor to just check on how she is because they had to proceed with the surgery. And when, they, when she went back to go check up with her doctor, everything was gone. Like legit healing that can't be explained yeah but i'm glad yeah. that you're working with the doctors too to because it sounds like a, everyone should have their own medical intuitive healer and their medical team so yeah. when are you coming to visit yes, us we need you to live with us <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting i know of a a a, a healer a healing touch person um, who works here in the Twin Cities uh, in Minnesota. And it's very similar. She will talk about feeling that pain and know where that pain is in somebody's body. I'm very curious about what, huh. she, what she'll say in response to this episode, which yeah. we've only just started. Um, but I also love kind of the confidence and the ease by which you talk about it because it, it feels like something you've obviously mastered mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, does it ever scare you to have this ability? I can't say it scares me, but at first I was more ashamed of it. You know, when you grow up and you're talking about things that you know, and people are like, well, how do you know that? You know, okay. and it's kind of like, uh, yeah. And I'll just give you an example. I was talking to a young lady. She was scheduled for a call by her mother as well. And uh, she's telling me about her boyfriend. Uh, like, oh, this is like, I was just asking, how is the problem? It was more like in a sexual abuse that she experienced affecting your relationships. And she started talking about her boyfriend. Oh, I have this other guy who loves me and I really love him. He's a nice person, but somehow I can't connect with this person. So the moment she started talking about the boyfriend, I just felt the nauseousness. And I just said, you are disgusted by this guy. Oh. And uh, she said, that's weird. How did you know that? Because that's how I feel. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's, so at that level where, when, but I, I just love, I mean, I accepted the weirdness. I'm weird, but on the other <laughs> hand, it's the weirdness that can help a lot of people because when it gets to whether it's shame and a lot of, a lot of pain, especially for guys as well, uh, if there is a heartache and all that, guys often don't want to talk about being heartbroken and all that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they numb it out. And for me, you can come wearing a suit and I see this amazing, attractive guy. But on the other hand, I can feel the bleeding of the heart or the young little man who is within. The, the, the inner children are also very, I would say, the aspects that are always mind blowing for me because it doesn't matter. I can have my own, like you have your questions, right? And I have my own questions like, oh, there's a breakthrough call. I'm just going to ask questions. And when the inner child is coming through, like I'm hurting. I, I'll have to drop everything and attend to this little child who's coming through because she wants mm -hmm. to be heard or he wants to be heard. And despite the adult maybe being there and kind of like stoic and all that, the inner child, they're always unapologetic and that's the unapologetic part of ourselves. So these are the parts that I just love the inner children because they don't care. Whatever plan you have is kind of like, I'm going to be here and I'm going to share what I want to share. So I would say the body is also that part of us that doesn't care how we address and what we're thinking because if there is pain the pain is going to be there and it doesn't mean i can talk about it now and maybe you're not experiencing it now but it's something that is there or you think you dealt with it because i've had people who like one guy he, he was a coach a business person as well and uh when he came through i just felt the whole heartache but it was more like numbing his um his left arm and i said i spoke about it and he was like oh my god I went to the doctor and I knew something was right, was not right. And the doctor said they couldn't see anything. 
and I ended up um, like he upped his insurance amount because he knew that something might happen, you know. And and that's the thing that with the medical system, the medical system might pick up a problem when it's a, it has already manifested in our physical body. But when we look at how we do things, we pick up things before they can manifest in the physical reality, whether it's mental, emotional, but we pick them up before they can get to a point where you have to, for instance, do a surgery or something like that, which is the beautiful thing. I feel this is more proactive than waiting before you are told, oh, you are in, for instance, if it's cancer, second stage, third stage and all that, you know, so how yeah. beautiful is it's beautiful. It's just a technique, a method like this, right? It's incredible. I mean, yeah. it, what I hear you saying, which I love, and Doug and I totally agree, that there is so much mental, phys mental and emotional work, which is why we think everyone should have a therapist, is because if you're not working on the mental and emotional pain, it does start to manifest into medical problems and yeah. like chronic stress um it's you know it's blood pressure and cholesterol and insomnia cortisol and cortisol and, cortisol and, yep. and yeah absolutely you know what's interesting about this um and i realize we could do a whole episode on this because i'm really I, fascinated and it is making i wrote down healing episode we need a yes. we need a few of you healers to come That's together cool. and really really just panel oh my gosh i'm excited by the whole thing um <laughs> But I want to go a couple of places. You know, you referenced the inner child. And I think, interestingly enough, we go about that in different ways. Like, I really strongly believe in, in going back and going through a very, very long history with every client I work with to make sure I understand how all of the emotional pieces fit together and how their experience growing up as a child, as an adolescent, affects their functioning as an adult. So we're going to jump just a little bit. Um, I want to stay with all of this, but I, I realize we have a topic of Mother's Day today. I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about your experience. We're going to talk about what it is for you to be a mother, but first we're going to talk about what it was for you to be mothered and parented. And I realize that, you know, myself, I do have a complicated relationship with my mothering experience. Uh, she is now deceased, um, but I've told the story many times. I had some abuse in my background, et cetera. But that experience um, of being parented affects how we feel about ourselves, how we uh, attach to other people, whether we feel safe and secure doing that. I'm wondering if you might share with our viewers and our listeners what your experience was being mothered. Yeah, um, I love I love the question, you know, especially when you're talking about motherhood. But first thing I would also want to bring in to say what is a mother? A mother is an archetype, is an identity, right? And yeah. a mother, it's a, like for me as a daughter, it's 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 an identity that is tied to my mother. How does my mother perceive me? You yep. know, there is a part of me that uh, loves the approval, is, is is hungry for it, the approval, the validation, and the mother as well. Um, her identity is to nature, and it's often, if at all, she's married, it's the husband and then the children, right? Mm -hmm. And we always, it's like something that also makes her proud. Right. Yep. So that on its own, it creates its own dynamics. And now going back to how I was mothered, um, I had siblings, uh, eight of my siblings. The other one is was my step stepbrother. And the other siblings we shared the same we shared the same mother but different father. I only shared the same father with my younger brother. So out of this amazing siblings that I had who were I would say obedient. I was seen as the one who wasn't obedient. Um, I was totally different. My family is more of a traditional family. And wherever I came from, I came from, I came with this thing that, hey, I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't subscribe to the all, whole traditional and all that. And my mother is someone who as a traditional society, you know, she took pride in the society. And I also shared with Talia yesterday that um my mother, I was born when my mom was 40 and my father was 60. And obviously that age difference that yeah. I had sisters were also, they were enough to be my, my mothers. And we actually, I shared the same, I would say same birthday with our children, right? They raised me up with their children, you know? So I didn't have that kind of like sibling mm -hmm. relationship. You know, they were more like a motherly figure as well. So I was different because they were, obviously they, they, they were born in a different timeline from, from mine, right? And I come through with this whole 
moxie, like an identity and thinking, I mean, I would say I'm, to complete that sentence is thinking that I'm better. And why is that? Because it's what I was told most of the time. Who the hell do you think you are? Yeah. You know, you are different from my children. You know, it, there was just that. But I always, even when it comes to dressing, I still remember I didn't like to dress with, like, dresses all the time. I wanted to wear uh, trousers and all that. And my mother was more of a traditional person. You know, I know even when I bought skirts, I would go buy some skirts, but more stylish. But still, the first thing is kind of like, oh, my mom is going to be happy. And when I wear that, I'm like, see me. She's just kind of like, what is that? You know, what, what is this you're wearing? You know, so I was not I was not accepted as I am because I was different from the other one. And I still remember, actually, one incident when she said that that um, she was still emphasizing that you are different. You are different. And one day I said, of course. How is my name? That's why my name is different. I can't be like them, you know. And she just laughed, but the laughter of, I don't know what I'm going to do with this naughty child, yeah. you know. But there was that wound still where I just realized later that I, I grew up with this wound, the desire to be accepted. And this this mother, mother toxic relationship, it actually played out in one of my first corporate highly paying job where I had a a boss who also treated me the same the same mm. as my mom. You know, it played out big time there. And uh, I still remember, my mom is also deceased right now for more than 10 years. And uh, with this dynamics, me looking for approval, every time wanting to satisfy her and all that. And I still remember, like I said, she was sick in the last year and we we're, were staying together by my place. And I was in my lowest, I was not working. And she was also sick. And she said something, and at that moment, I snapped. And I said, I know you hate me with all the emotions. And that caught her off guard, I would say. And she stopped. And that was like the first time I've seen her being touched and confused and hurt. And we looked at each other, and she said, I don't hate you. I don't hate you, but I was never taught how to affirm a child. What I learned is that if you affirm a child, she's going to be big headed. Mm. So I I would say that was like our last exchange. And then maybe a month or two, she passed on. But um, at the end of the day, there's still lots of work that that had to be done afterwards. And uh, it still left that wound of which as much as consciously I was aware of the mother wound that was there, this is another topic for another day, but there was still like the deepest wounding, but that was very unconscious was from my father at the same time. And now it's kind of like the two being brought together as wow. a girl who didn't know how to relate even with women. Cause it even causes, it causes us to, especially as a girl, if you don't know how to, if your mother doesn't accept you, approve of you, it, it, it makes you doubt who you are, your truth, and all that. And it also, even when it comes to friendship and all that, there is still a part of you that is still longing to be accepted. And you always deny who you are. You always deny your truth. And you just want to give to other people. Maybe they'll accept you. And the thing is, when we are not in alignment with our truth, there's going to be a time when you fucking snap out of it. And ah, all the rage and everything come out, right? <laughs> Well, I'm curious when you talk about snapping out of it, you know, I will say that some people never get there. Mm -hmm. You know, they live with this woundedness that tells them they're not good enough. They're constantly seeking affirmation in ways that may be maladaptive or unfortunate. I think about a lot of people who don't feel worthy or deserving of love or, you know, connection with other people, even on a friendship level. I'm very curious about your snap out of it moment. Was there a, an, a, a time that you remember where you kind of figured out, this is not about me. My value and my worth is not about what my parents may or may not be able to give me. There is different moments that are coming through. But uh, for instance, when you're talking about, like, for instance, in my case, uh, anger was one of my emotions. Like that was like my base, right? And especially when it comes to- I understand. Family. Yeah. So the other people outside, I was like the nice person, unless they do something over and over again. And now it's kind of like, you're going to know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah. But the thing is, when it gets to that point, like, for instance, with me, I would say things 
that I've been bottling up. And then from there, I'll sit there and feel guilty again. Ugh, I shouldn't have said that. Still, it's, it's from another end to another end. That's yeah, right. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So for me, like, I just knew I was different and they, it was also said. But one thing that I knew is kind of like, I always repeated to myself, when I grow up, I'm going to go away. And um, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to, I don't, I doubt if I'm going to ever keep in touch with my family. Mm -hmm. That's what I knew. Like I grew up with that. But when I was like 18, 17, 18, I just had this, I don't even know what to call it. Probably it was a download because by then I didn't know anything about all the spirituality terms and all that. Yeah. But I knew it's kind of like I had this download where I was shown everything, like with my siblings, like it's got nothing to do with you that dealing oh. with their own wounds, their own pain. Yeah. Like I got to understand that when I was like 18 or something like that. And then I went through life still with that, and it happened, the snapping out of it, really, <laughs> I would say it didn't happen, but I kind of like got shown a lot of things. You know, at times, like I had these visions where I saw what I saw, but the, it was more like, I would say that there's one vision that I had where I kind of like saw my siblings, something was not right with me, and I saw my siblings and they were laughing. And I just woke up from this, I'm like, what the hell does this mean? So it still brought the thing that, it's kind of like they can't be happy with me. They'll be happy when I'm down, you know, whatever that is. And I held into this. I'm like, okay, whatever that is. And the waking up, the snapping out of it is when life happened. Mm -hmm. I lost my job after I said, okay, fine. I'm going to go and try life somewhere else. Um, my mother got sick. My younger brother got into an accident, near death accident. And after my mom died, we started this, this cases with my, with my children, the father of my children fighting for the children. And that was the snapping out of it basically, because as much as it was painful and it's quite interesting because this literally happened where I had all these things where I can buy love or trade or whatever shit I was doing, you know, but now when I had nothing, it's kind of like, down, down, feeling unworthy, feeling powerless mm -hmm. and all that. And the only thing that I had as mothers, we always, we take pride in the strength from being mothers. It's an identity that esteems us, right? Mm -hmm. And at the moment when the, my boyfriend took me to court and he, he, yeah, he had access to these children and I was kind of like just somebody there. I didn't know who I was. I was angry with life. I wanted this guy out. You know, if I could, I would have just killed him. That's just mm -hmm. how I felt. And he said, as my yeah. as I would kill for my children. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting because after I moved to Germany and started still fighting this case from here, there was a time because I worked, I was working as an accountant after I came here. The other time I just came from work and I was just like, oh, I want a journal you know, feeling that still coming through. And I just wanted to take a shower. And then from there, by then my now ex-husband was out on a sailing trip and I was just by myself. I took a paper, I sat in the dining room and I started writing. And I wrote, I'm like, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to post this nice message, you know, it's for other people, right? So I started writing, who are you without your mother? Who are you without a job? Who are you without? It started a lot of things. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And in the end, who are you without your children? Mm -hmm. That's what broke me apart because I was like, I don't know who I am. And that's when I realized this message is for me. Who am I? Who am I, really? Who am I? Yeah. And I would say the incident of being separate from, separated from my children, that's what was calling me to find who I am. Because even at that moment, I was still angry with my siblings because my mom was already late that, oh, you guys don't care what is happening, don't care how I feel. But the question was, who are you? And that was the point where I had to find who I am. And I remember there was a moment where, where this is why even when I shared the email address, it's Joy's mission. When I was called, to, when I was asked, why can't you find joy where you are at mm. by yourself? You know, why do we believe that our children are the source of our joy, a source of our happiness, or even of the strength and whatever? So I would say the snapping out of it was life happening mm. to me, for me, through me. You know, yeah. but at that moment, I felt like a victim. And often we find the victim, when I say, oh, you feel like a victim, Talia, 
there is a part of you that wants to defend that, especially mm. the word that is, I would say, overused out there. Like, I'm not a victim and all that. But the truth is, we are not victims, but we are having victim experiences. And feeling like a victim as well, like you say, there's some people who are numb and they're just like going through life. And I feel like when you feel like a victim, it's, it's the first, first stage of like, oh, something is happening, but I don't like it. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel good. You know, so it was, it was that stage where I was kind of like, something is happening to me and I don't like this because besides a lot of things that happened, it's kind of like, it was kind of like normal because when you talk to someone and say, this is what my mother says, kind of like, ah, that's how mothers are. Don't worry. We, we say that to each other, right? In the society. Oh, that's how mothers are. That's, you know, you, you don't want to hear what my mother did. And it's kind of like, we just want to continue with that. It's okay. You know, and I still remember this incident knowing my gift now and knowing how I also work in dreams or even travel when I'm supposed to be sleeping. Right. And I still remember as a child when I did something, <laughs> don't let me sleep. Especially that I'll be running away because I, you know, I'm going to be beaten. And then when I'm sleeping, I'll just be awoken with a stick. And that's something that <laughs> it pisses me off when I think of it like, I mean, as a child, you just uh, innocent there sleeping. Yeah. How does someone sleep with so much anger and wake up with it to take the blankets of a child and start beating the child? You understand? It's somebody who is holding a lot of anger and all that within them. It's somebody who is wounded if you can hold that. And even when you see a sleeping baby, you can't at least feel sorry to, you know, attack the person when the person is up, not when they are just like, you know, so it's, it's one of, it's one of those things. So that's my experience basically with the, with the mother, with my mother journey. So I doubted who I am. And, and it's quite interesting because even when I look at these parents, I had to do a lot of work business wise. They were still showing up. And I realized at some point as well that even when I go through life, there is a part of me that I still want to make my mom proud. Let's just look at the whole spiritual, um, religious background that I grew up in. And at some point I stopped going to church. And this is something that my mom was worried about. I don't know what happened to you. You stopped going to church and all that. It's kind of like, now I'm really that bad child. And instead of going back when I connect with my gifts and doing my own thing, I'm now into the spiritual um, path, which is something that they don't understand. And actually my mom came through from the other side and said, if I was still alive, I was not going to believe what else that you're doing, you know? And and now because she's on the side, other side, she sees things differently. So yeah. when I started my journey, there was a part of me that I was kind of like, I kind of, I was still looking for that. Like, I don't know if my mom would be happy with this. Like I wanted to get approval, you know, like, where is she? What would she say? You know, and it's the same thing that I was working around with life, making decisions from that, you know? So it's, it's, it's when it comes to your purpose, your joy and everything, that relationship is like in the forefront and it happens unconsciously where every time you are looking for approval, for validation. And the other time when it actually kind of like came to my awareness, I did something and a lot of people were talking, like it was on Facebook, a lot of people started writing message. Oh, how I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I responded to two people and the third person I felt like, something is not like I couldn't take that in Mm. and that's when it dawned on me I took some days and I came back afterwards because I realized the person that I want to say this is my mom but she's not oh I mean your whole story of being this child that I mean and the full circle you have brought in like the attachment pain the mother wound, the generational trauma where you got to hear from your mother at the end that she does not hate you, but she was worried that if she showed you love, you would get a big head or just feeling like all of the ways that you were shining brightly and different were not appreciated and not valued. And so you becoming more and more you was pushing you further and further away from this connection with your mom. I mean, but clearly you're a person that's done your work to even see, even with the siblings, that this wasn't about me. Because like you said, it can really destroy your sense of worthiness and being able to be loved, your ability to take love or approval that you're desperate for because who you really needed it from 
can't give it to you or won't give it to you. I mean, these are such powerful messages. And I think really common messages. I think, you know, I'm getting a, a very serious face about this conversation because, of course, you reference sexual, uh, physical abuse. I don't know if there was sexual abuse. Did you reference that earlier? It's a story that I can, it's, it's a bit different from my experience, but I mentioned it, that it's something that comes through. And that I is also it. one thing okay. that leads me to the whole sexual abuse thing is the inner child. I'll share my story with that, but you can go ahead and share what you want to share. Please don't forget it. It's really important because abuse really takes a toll on, again, our sense of deservingness and worthiness. And I want to just highlight that. Um, I also want to make sure that everyone listening, I mean, you know, you kind of talk about how you would kill for your children and yet they were taken away in what sounds like a legal process. I don't know if you want to expand on that at all. Um, that was a very painful thing. I have two kids as well and I am divorced from their mother who is still a best friend of mine as, as our viewers know. But I also, um, the whole thought of not having my kids is really frightening to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, as, as every person, when, when you go through the process where, oh, there's papers, actually the first papers I received from my boyfriend's lawyer, and I'm saying my boyfriend, I mean, I'm saying my boyfriend here. So when you're talking about a boyfriend, you don't expect the whole custody issue to be something. Yeah. Fusion, all right. That. Yeah. Absolutely so not. In my case, there was, and people actually thought that I was lying when I mentioned it. And I'm like, hmm. What are you talking about? So just from the beginning, when I first received the papers, I was told that there are some papers that came through. I was in, in Munich. Uh, that was like my second visit, but the longest one, like for three months, you know, so this thing came through. But at the end of the day, I was just like, I was not worried. I'm like, my daughter was five. My son was seven. I'm like, I raised this kid basically by myself, mm -hmm. you know, and there is proof because at some point I swallowed my pride when a friend of mine spoke to me and said, just go report this guy for for maintain what is, is it maintenance child maintenance yeah yeah so like at child first child. i had this proud for every waking mother and if you can afford it's kind of like i'll take care of my my children and i don't care about that man's money and all that so i had that as well until a friend of mine just said how you just need to do it you know and i did it and it was good because when he reported us, I'm like, I have evidence. There is court papers here where he was asked for child maintenance and he never even kept up. He did it whenever he wanted. So with my pride and confidence, I was like, okay, cool, you know, and hired a lawyer and went back to, to court, you know, and the first hearing, I was just blown away and I changed seven lawyers. I even went to higher court and I lost every single time every single time and the crazy thing here is even when they decided that my children are going to move in with his father it was not like oh his father is stable and all that he was they were going to move into my father my their father and his sister-in-law slash girlfriend i still remember i mean sister-in-law <laughs> i still remember when i was called for, for the first meeting and the social worker said you need to come it's going to be you and uh and the children's father and his girlfriend's sister-in-law and i'm like i had my pride as well and i said what i said yeah. and the the social worker said you are really naive if you can just know that your children are going to be living with this at this woman's place <laughs> to add insult to injury and i think you told me in our little meet and greet that the boyfriend was dating the sister-in-law while you were together like he cheated on yeah. you with her yeah yeah goodness okay and now they were moving to her place you know and then and, and there was that thing that, that i mean for them, it was like, we're going to put you in your place. You know, you're going to put you in your place, go to your children. And his, his mother also saw like before he said that I'm going to take this children no matter what it takes. So we got, we got there and here they are winning, you know. And I, like I said, I went through different lawyers and all that and nothing was happening. And then one thing that I sat with while I, after I moved to Germany, I was just grateful every day to say, at least nothing has happened to my children. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are okay so far. And then one day I received a call and my father said, you may need to sit down. And she said, he said, 
Fiona might never walk again. She had an accident. She was bitten by two road violas. And uh, the strength that I had, the fight that I had, everything that I held into, at that moment, I was like, I'm tired of being strong. Mm. I am tired of being strong. And uh, But still, there was the spark. You know, I went back to Botswana and I was like, I'm going to start again searching for social workers. I'm going to start because like I was like, this is, these are different social workers. And it's quite interesting because some social workers referred me to another another ministry. And it's, and look at the interesting thing. When I went into that meeting where somehow they handled these cases and guess who I had an appointment with when I opened the door to this first appointment in the office where they normally help with this case. Who? My the father of my children's cousin. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Well, that's a small world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, so I attended it. Like I told her that I can't. So bring someone else. But after all, I knew that it's not gonna work. Whatever my intentions were, I let it go. My hope was in the social workers who was at the hospital because there was a lot of things that were not right with my daughter. So I'm like, okay, fine, I can build a case at least when I have support from the social workers. And she took the files and said, this is an easy, easy case and all that. I had my hopes up. And at the end, she gave me back the files. And she said, if you were meant to have these children, you would have had them. This is an easy case. But um, this is a special war. Like you couldn't win this no matter what. But what, what I hear you saying is that you had made peace in this sort of defeated way but then something that happened with your daughter woke you up to that fire again yeah. and you found that fight yeah is your daughter okay she, she's okay she's got her own like the scars that she'll grow because the whole part of her thigh has been taken away by these dogs oh. and all that and she's she still didn't like some some veins were cut from these dogs it was it was horrible and the worst part of it actually when i look at the the injustice part of it mm. this uh, like my ex-boyfriend he had problems with alcohol and this accident happened on a monday when the children were supposed to, to, to be at school but because he was drunk on that weekend on monday they couldn't go to school and oh. then that on that day it happened it was a day before before her birthday even you know, so it was one of those things. And I was just like, I bet I have a case here. So I'm just going to go back to court and see what I can come up with, you know. And when the, the, the social worker said what, he, what she said, I was like, okay, um, I'll see what I'm going to do. I may have to go for the ninth lawyer. I think that was the time I went to the, to, I appealed this case before at the high court, but still I was turned down, you know. But at this moment, I was like, I had to come back because I had work here. And when I was here, still trying to find a way because I had some medical receipts and everything, a lot of things that happened. That's when I heard a voice again. Mm. You are not going to win. The odds are against you. Mm. And uh, I had to come back again and say, what am I supposed to do? And uh, some words that were said, and I would love every mother to hear this, because mm. the first thing that I asked, which I was asked was, who are you without a children? You know? Because your children are not your source of joy. And with this incident, as much as I was blaming the father, but it's blaming, it's a fact, it's true. I mean, we say these things, but on the other hand, the question is, even if something is true, does it help us build what we desire? Does it help us in what we want to achieve, in what, who we want to be? You understand? So at times we hold into something to say something happened. It's fact. It's true. It may be true, but it doesn't help you. Right. So for me, it was that, that, okay, this man is a, is a, is an alcoholic. This thing's happened because of his irresponsibility and all that. And I had all this anger, even though I was tired. But the worst that came through is how the problem is you think these children belong to you, mm. but they don't belong to you. They belong to God. They are on a mission as much as you are on a mission. And tell me what would have happened if at all this incident happened when the children by, by, were by you? And why would you think there is something better that you can do that the angels cannot do? And that's why every time you talk, there's this whole intergenerational piece. It's like you're seeing things on so many different dimensions. And we were going to, what I wanted to bring together was this idea that, I mean, 
for women, we are daughters and also maybe mothers. And for sons, we're sons and also maybe fathers. But when you think about that mother wound and how you were living with this mother wound and these unmet needs, thinking they were about you, and then because of trauma, because of maybe being drawn to the wrong person from a toxic relationship, from your own journey, your own struggles, now your children also have a mother wound that has nothing to do with them, right? It's like yeah. a limitation. We're all trying our best, but it just goes to show it's not about us. And it, your mom, I mean, you're again, like this experience with your mom being able to say, this is why I wasn't able to meet your needs. And for your own children to be finding their way back to you after this trauma, that we're just all very human and moving along our paths, even if we have the best of intentions. Yeah. I think two things about this. Um, Maybe one question and one comment. Like when we talk about this trauma, you know, one of my thoughts about it is that we, it doesn't necessarily go away. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you talk about the anger, which I totally relate to, um, if I'm hurt or if I'm feeling vulnerable or if I'm feeling at risk, especially if my emotional resources are depleted. Um, and when you talk about being tired, I mean, I think our ability to be resilient to those emotional experiences lessens. Um, yeah. And I tend to think that, you know, the, I, I want to use the word grief here. Like you're talking about so many losses on so many levels and it's complicated and it doesn't necessarily get recognized. I appreciate your face um, and recognizing that, that that connects for you. It's a very complicated thing. And I think grief is a lifelong process. Um, I want to jump a little bit. We are going to so run out of time because well, um, I got so are. much. Yes, I know. But we can't. I feel like how you naturally moved through like the entire itinerary. I agree. Yep. But I want to ask you a question. Um, so what is your relationship with your kids today? It's, it's good and not good. <laughs> you have the best face. Yes. Like I can, <laughs> it's very real. I feel like I know what you're going to say before you say it. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Tell me more, please. And, and it's quite interesting. And what a perfect, what a perfect day that I came through this note. You know, when you, you you spoke about loss, and the loss of being separated from your children is different in the sense of when I tell someone, even when I talk about grief, someone can be like, "Oh, at least they're alive." It's different when a child is dead. But there mm. were times when I felt like if. I was dealing with death. I would know better how to navigate it, especially yeah. at the time when I didn't know if I was going to be with them. And in a society mm. that we live in, as a, as a mother, especially that a mother, it's that it has its own status, right? And it has its own identity. There's a way that is perceived when it comes to, to the society. When you talk about being separated from your children, people don't have that compassion for you like someone who lost their child they raise the eyebrows first yes that's right yeah. there's like judgment or they're yeah. quick to make assumptions about you and, and at times it's just unconscious like oh my god i don't know how i'd live without my children because and you are just here like going like i don't know how do like it's and it's, it's, it's like natural. It's just something that comes natural. But on the other hand, for me, there is a bit of shame as in like, am I not being a mother enough? Am I not loving enough if I'm able to try to put another foot in front of the other? Right. You know, yeah, what for people sure. don't see is they don't see me when I wake up, maybe from a dream crying mm -hmm. or maybe trying to reach out to my children and I can't reach them out. And then I wake up. And I realize this is not a dream, it's my reality. And yeah. I continue crying from the dream now to the reality, right? Mm -hmm. So it took that doing of work when I was asked, do you want your children or not? And I said, I want my children. And I said, oh, you got to do the work. What work? Forgive. I don't even know what the fuck that means. <laughs> I don't know what that means. We don't no. either. We're no. discussing it every day. <laughs> no. And, and that's the thing that at times we rush to say, oh, I've forgiven. I didn't know how to forgive. I didn't even yeah. know how to find that within me. And I was just that vulnerable. And I was just asked, 
they said every day connect with us. That's my high self. And I said, how would I know if I've done the work? And I was told I had to open a new habit children back. So right. I started with that patience. I don't even know how that happened or when that happened. I still remember the moment when I knelt and I called my boyfriend's ancestors and all that. And my prayer at that moment was show him the way, protect him, guide him because he was in a bad state when mm -hmm. that relationship collapsed. And I felt for my children, I'm like, even if he did this, I want my children to have that father. And I prayed for this man. I still remember when I provided for them from here and I sent money for them to buy food. I didn't, I, like, it's kind of like I was a totally different person, yeah. you know. And at the end, I ended up having my children here without a mediator, without a lawyer. Like, life was just taking its course and running its own course. And when it happened, um, if my daughter came first and my son followed after something like six months or so because he was writing his standard seven exams. And uh, it's quite interesting because, like, that's also another, it's kind of like a different version, diving into another dimension because they came through first for a visit when I had my my daughter here with my now ex-husband. And uh, when they moved in already, my daughter came in when we were already separating with my with my ex-husband. So they kind of like came into a different, but again, a toxic environment in a way. You understand? Right. So that's what they came into. And like I said, it was, it was, we couldn't connect because they were young, five years. And then when, when she came through, which was almost 10, my son came, my son came through when he was almost, was it 12 or something like that? You know? Yeah. So when they came through expecting something different and they came here into separation, divorce, you know, and my son was angry actually with that. He was, he was angry, like really angry. Yeah. Right. And my daughter wanted the mother's attention when she first came. But at that moment, my son, my, my husband was still in my life and he was not understanding of oh. the relationship that needs to be, to be repaired. You oh. know, so my daughter felt like she's being pushed away. And I came through this note. It, it's a simple note. I was looking at it and I wanted to actually throw away some papers and I came through it. And I'm like, hmm, this is, I read through it again. And that's the reason why I kept it. And I'm just going to read it for you. Read it. To where she was, like, when she first came. She wrote, when I look up in the sky, I see life and death. Life is like a flower, stone, and a bed. Death is like the wind, smooth and fast, but sometimes hurts like thunder through one's eyes. I feel lonely, even if thousands of people surround me. Lonely as the wind. Pe people take me as stupid, but I know I'm smart. People take me as heartless, but I know I'm not. People think they know me, but I know nothing about me. I feel lost. And when I say something they don't expect, they feel I'm even more heartless. I live through pain. I take others' pain away when they shout at me. Oh, how I mean, it's so powerful and so beautiful. And maybe the perfect ending to this really important conversation about being a child and being a mother. And it is an honor to mothers everywhere to just acknowledge that this isn't all fun and games. It's so challenging to forgive and accept and have compassion for our mothers and then for ourselves and then to reconnect with our children because we're just humans. We're just all trying. And yeah. I'm so grateful for your vulnerability and your touching story and for sharing yeah. it with us today. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for your time. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to wrap it up to say, when we are, when we, like for instance, for me, when I look at our children, and like, I feel like children are a bridge to us and to our parents. Mm -hmm. Through my children, I can relate with my inner child. Like when I read this, 
I would have written this as well. And uh, when my daughter was going through that, I can relate with my mother who also had her own turbulence, whatever that was happening. That's she didn't right. know how to yep. deal with it. Right. And it took some work. I was just sharing with Talia as well that I did, um, I, I did a women motherhood healing in, in February as much as I was doing the work, but I offered this and I felt a huge shift. And since February till a week ago, my daughter was sleeping with me in the same bed. And uh, that was like the bond that I've longed for since we separated. But we were laughing. It was just a beautiful relationship to see after that incident. I did this on Women's Day and that changed things for me and her. So it was beautiful to watch that. And it's also one of my desires. I, I, one thing that I say is I just, I see the moment where a girl child can be herself, can express herself, and she can also be honored even in her sexuality, which is something that we haven't touched on, but I'd love to touch on this sometime when we have time. Cause yeah, I love really the nice. topic. I, me, I love it too. Its own. Yeah. It's a fantastic topic. You know, I think the humanness by which you approach your role as a mother and as a child of obviously your mother specifically, but you talk so beautifully about this lifelong process of healing, this lifelong process of understanding ourselves. Um, and really at the end, you know, you referenced this before our kids are looking for us to be as solid as we can be, to be healthy as we can be. And that's not an easy task. So you're quite a role model for everyone to get through a very complicated, challenging situation. I wish you a meaningful and peaceful Mother's Day as you move forward in your own journey. Thank you so much. And I wish you all and your listeners a wonderful, magical and orgasmic day. I love that. Thank you so much. That was her sign off to have a magical and orgasmic day. And that's when I knew we needed to reach out to you. How will you tell us how our listeners can find you? Um, I'm everywhere in, um, in social media, just how much a G A O M O T S E double M E. And if you reach me through this, just let me know you came through this because I would like to say, give you a gift of the women's day. Um, conversation that we had or healing that I had. I'd like to give to listeners with that. So when they reach out, they'll just tell me, hey, I'm from We Are Not Fine podcast. And how I'm beautiful, beautiful. We Are Not Fine, right? And there is power in just saying, I'm not fine. I need that's correct. That's, right. that's, that's correct. what the strength is. I love that. So just tell me we are coming from this and then I'll send you the, I'll send you the, the, the masterclass that I did because there may be some nuggets that you'll receive from that, especially on Mother's Day. How beautiful is that? It's beautiful. And we will have everything in the show notes so that people can see how you spell your name. They can find you on social media. And yes, you are just so beautiful and so lovely. And I can't believe that from across the universe, you found us and it was the perfect time. And we're so grateful. I'm so grateful too. <laughs> I'm so grateful. Please take care of, your, please Bye, take care of yourself. Hal. I will <laughs> take care of myself too. Bye-bye. <laughs> That was really powerful. So I find myself oftentimes with guests like this, you know, we have a script ahead of time. I always say this, but it never happens. Uh, there'll be things that get triggered for me. And I realize that the way that I think and the way that I think as a therapist is that I oftentimes go off into tangents because I have these spider webs going on in my head about how things connect. Um, and this was a very powerful conversation with a really bright, insightful, articulate mm. person about what her experience has been. And some of it's kind of tragic. You know, there's abuse, there's trauma, there's all of those things. And all of these experiences affect our ability to feel good about ourselves, to feel worthy and deserving, as I said at the beginning of this episode, of what it is that, you know, love can be in our relationships, Same. with our friendships, with our kids, etc. And boy, I could go on and on, but I want to talk about like attachment. I know. And what the impact of you know, abuse and trauma is on that and our ability to have secure attachments and, you know, our emotional regulation and whether or not we're able to really just listen to ourselves and stay present. Our guests talked about anger and I want to call it rage, yeah. um, which I can certainly relate to. If I get, you know, sometimes in the right situation, if I get hurt, I'm like, I'm off to the races, like, especially if I've had a little 
drinking as well. I, yes. I found myself unable to regulate as well. So it's an interesting thing that happens to us as human beings. And really, our podcast, Talia, mm. is about being fucking real yes. about what it means to be human. That's right. And how our mental health issues affect our relationships. That's exactly right. And it's not all fun and games. And I mean, she is talking about the mother wound and how we heal the mother wound. And that is, it felt like the most important piece of honoring Mother's Day, not just for the Instagram perfect mother, but for all of us. And so if we had to even just describe what the most common mother wounds are that we're talking about, it's rejection, which is a big part of today. It's abandonment, which is also another part of today's episode, right? It's like we have our own trauma and our own limitations. And then there's betrayal and then there's abuse. And they all affect us so deeply in yeah. so many different ways. And I mean, I'm just really curious after this episode, how people are even feeling about their own sense of their relationship with their mother yeah. and their relationship maybe with their kids or their stepkids. And I loved so much the way that Hao was talking about all of it because she saw the relationships not as just mother, child, child mother but all of the ancestors and all of the pain and the trauma and the limitations and even if we're trying there are unmet needs and i'll say you know i did find myself throughout the entire conversation realizing sometimes we get into these conversations and the time goes so fast i will say that happens in the 55 minute sessions i have with patients as well mm. i think one of you know there's so many kind of unanswered questions i wanted to delve a little bit more deeply into the detachment from her kids and what it means to try to rebuild and restore those relationships after a departure from her life. Um, she lives in a different culture now in Germany versus Botswana. So we have a lot of different pieces to this puzzle that I, I think kind of raise some uh, additional curiosities and questions for me. But bottom line, you're right. I mean, all of these mother wounds that, you know, this particular guest experienced, I encourage every one of our listeners and viewers to really think about like, what was my experience? That's right. And I want to just uh, be so encouraging of anybody who has a loving, safe, consistent relationship with their parent, whether it be male or female, we'll obviously do a Father's Day special yes. too. Yes. Um, but I want to say, I mean, I think this is the big piece. Like life is not perfect. And I think, you know, our work is so much on people getting honest about what their pain is. You know, I mentioned grief at one point in the episode and her eyes kind of lit up because mm -hmm. it's one of the things that is lifelong as my dear friend, Kelly, um, who has been on our podcast and I've been a guest speaker for her podcast as well. You know, I think these, these experiences in life, there's all kinds of things that happen. And I think, you know, trying to sweep things under the rug, the proverbial rug, um, is never the right thing to do for our ability to be healthy in our own lives, not only internally with ourselves, but also with others. So it's a very complicated matter. And I am so glad that we honored it in a very we're not fine kind of way. Well yeah. I, I pulled agree. together a couple of thoughts um, on if we do want to just sit and acknowledge where we are as the child, where we are as the parent and think about like potential repair. I thought about sort of just offering some suggestions for Mother's Day that if we want to try and initiate some sort of a repair, if there's a strained relationship with our mothers, and it's really complicated, right? This could be a whole session in and of itself. Yes. But what I pulled together as just a couple of thoughts that I hope are helpful are, first of all, Level set your expectations. We all have our unmet needs and our deep longing that our mothers might not even be capable of sitting with our true emotions, our pain, our frustrations. They might not have the emotional maturity to not be defensive, but just sit with your experience as your experience. So what would it look like if they were able to sit with that versus what kind of a relationship can you have with them if they are not able to have that honest conversation? A thought is go into these meetings with your mom 
grounded with a lot of self-love so that you are not finding yourself really triggered and defensive from the get-go, but even just remembering that you might no longer need their approval as desperately as you did and their inability to give that to you or meet your needs has nothing to do with you. So that also felt really important. My last comment um, might sound a little dark, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. Do it. You know, I think Talia's recommendations are good, but as people who have been watching our podcast for some time now know, I decided to choose other people in my life who were maternal figures. Um, I have two people, uh, one in particular, who really served a very significant role as a, a mother to me who was not my biological mother and is rather the friend of one of uh, the mother of one of my dearest friends. She played such a significant role in showing me love and showing that she had my back and that she believed me and that she believed in me. Um, and that really did have a significant impact on who I am today. So I just want to also say that wow. do not feel like you're failing. Do not feel like you should have anything to be ashamed of or that you're inadequate in any way. If mm -hmm. you do not choose to try to repair a relationship with your mother on this holiday season. Exactly, because they might you. not be capable of right. meeting you even nearly where you are or what you deserve. I love the idea that we're all in the market for <laughs> like a mother figure, <laughs> which also it's right. important to just think about the capacity you have to make change in this relationship 100%. or yeah. not. Like, is there a way that you can maybe set up a situation where if you know there are certain things you and your mother can do well, like maybe go on a walk or get your nails done or like go out for a 10 minute coffee or see a movie so that you don't have to interact so much. You can maybe get ahead of creating a situation where you can easily leave or you can control the cadence and the the vibe of the meeting and not feel trapped in maybe childhood misery, if that's what it was for you. <laughs> so many different ways of creating a meaningful, boundaried, more enjoyable Mother's Day for people who are mothers or on the other side as that's children right. of mothers. Um, in any case, do what's right for you and listen to yourself and take care of yourself during this holiday. And I have thoughts. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> about how to repair your relationship with your child. If you are that mother <laughs> that's been listening to yeah. all of this and yep. you have this maybe like yucky feeling about like, am I that mother that they might be talking about that just can't figure out how to meet And my if you don't question needs. that, you're probably not doing your job because I right. think we should all question it, right? You know what? I come, I love that. I agree yeah. with that. But yep. if there's a part of you that's wondering like, oh, am I causing some mother wounds? Yeah. Right. Here yeah. are maybe the thoughts about that. How do we heal the relationships with our children? Are we emotionally mature enough to sit with the possibility that they might have feelings, frustrations about us? Can we sit with that without getting defensive or angry or like a, yeah, well, you do this and you do that? Because it is about like also this sense of attunement. That's what there's a lot of longing to be. Uh, what do people, what are the wounds? What do people want from their mother? They want to feel good enough to be loved, warts and all. They want to know, like everyone who's just like, I just want approval. Can you, are you doing that? Are you letting your children know that you love them just the way you they are, even if that's not how you would have chosen they would be, if that's not what you were planning for or hoping for? Can you love them and accept them just as they are? Or are you going to maybe die on the hill of your beliefs that they should be this or should be that? So just encouraging you to open your heart to your child who will always and forever be desperate for your love and approval and acceptance. It almost feels like unconditional love, right? Yeah. Like loving that person as the person they are and not seeing them necessarily as a reflection of you. We want our kids to be the best that they can be and they are separate from us, even though we'd like them to may maybe be like you said, something that resembles what we thought might be the case for them. That's right. It's not about us. Our goal is to nurture and love our children for who they are. So I appreciate that everyone might take a look at that as well. That's right. Yeah. 
just food for thought. And it is a, a beautiful, complicated day, and we're honoring mothers of all kinds um, and children of mothers of all kinds. And as you can see from today, that looks a million different ways. So happy Mother's Day to all of the lovely, lovely, lovely women in my life who are mothers. And happy Mother's Day to you. Why, thank you. You're welcome. And where can they find us, Mr. Douglas Jensen? For sure at we'renotfine.com. That's right. Where they can subscribe now as a Patreon <gasps> at various levels. Yes. They can write us questions that they would like us to answer. I was up in Elk River with my sister and our lovely, lovely server, Deirdre, who goes by D said she has absolutely something to write into us so i'm hoping she does well she all i recognize her name she already wrote a little <laughs> contact form Woo, deirdre that's so fantastic so anybody who has a question of any kind related to mental health relationships mm -hmm. the correlation between the two the association between the two any stories you want to share about Mother's Day, we would love to share with our audience as well. 1000%. And also, as Doug mentioned, we have new, we're just launching it today, really, is our Patreon. We have so much to offer you. This is just what you are. We do our weekly podcast. We try to give you our heart and soul. But what you aren't getting are our really funny newsletters that we're about to create like our content calendar all the amazing live events there are there's the one dollar patreon level the five dollar the 15 the 25 you could go see all of the different ways that we can be in relationship we've got like bi-weekly vlogs we've got discounted live performances or you know our live yeah. podcasts free merch merch sales um, we got so much going on. We have so much going on and we're so excited that you are going to be a part of it. Oh yeah, our live monthly chats. So you just see what more are you interested in and let's get that relationship going. Find us on YouTube, on Instagram. TikTok. TikTok. We're basically We're Not Fine Pod, <laughs> DR Talia Jackson, Douglas L. Jensen. We are everywhere. And remember, we're not fine. But at least we're not stuck at the Bryn Mawr Festival of Garage Sales on day two where there's nothing but rubbish. That's what's going on in our neighborhood today. That's a nice market. It was. It was cute day one. But if you're scraggling around today, forget about it. See you next week. Bye.